Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Diane Chamberlain is a book rack, bookstore, Kindle, and now audiobook literary legend. With 30 years and as many novels to her name, People Magazine raved of The Last House on the Street, one of her most recent bestsellers, that her latest is a twisty, riveting ride. Signatures that trace all the way back to 1989 with Private Relations, which kicked off a four-decade career that continued to grow in sales and popularity with new hits like Love and Strangers, Secret Lives, Keeper of the Light, Fire and Rain, Brass Ring, Reflection, The Escape Artist, Breaking the Silence, Summer's Child, The Courage Tree, Cypress Point, also known as The Shadow Wife, Kiss River, Her Mother's Shadow, The Bay at Midnight, The Secret Life of C.C. Wilkes, also known as A Beautiful Lie, Before the Storm, Secrets She Left Behind, The Lies We Told, The Midwife's Confession, The Good Father, Necessary Lies, where career-long fan Publishers Weekly felt Chamberlain ratchets up the tension with the ever-present mystery of what Anne might be up to, and the dual narratives merge beautifully before an explosive conclusion. This will keep readers enthralled. And Newsweek gave it five stars, with the reviewer promising they would for sure be reading more of Diane Chamberlain's books. It's an excitement that has stayed electric among multiple generations of readers as she's continued to entertain with new hits like The Silent Sister, which The Guardian promised was perfect for summer and a reliably enjoyable read. Pretending to Dance, The Stolen Marriage, where the Princeton Review is moved by the amazing sense of time and place and the way she totally captures the bigotry and prejudices pervasive during that period. The Dream Daughter and Big Lies in a Small Town, and titles that have been published in 20 countries around the world and counting and she's here today to talk about it all. Diane, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Long before you began your writing career, when you look back on your childhood growing up in New Jersey, were you surrounded by stories and books? And what kind of impact did they make on you at that age? I think that, um, you know, my parents were really big readers. And so we always had books and we were always read to as little kids. Now we understand you actually penned your first novellas at 12. Any other insights you can give us into what inspired you as a fledgling writer growing up? In the first grade, my teacher read us a chapter from Charlotte's Web every day. And I, you know, up until then, it had been all those little golden books um, that don't really go very far. Um, but Charlotte's Web had me crying and laughing. And I think it's the first time I realized that a human being could create a story that made you feel all these feels. And so that's when I decided that I wanted to be a writer. And so as a kid, I did write all these little books um, that I found when I cleaned out my parents' house, my mother had wrapped them in saran wrap. So I still actually have them. They're just terrible. But, um, but very, you know, it really was my first foray into writing. When you got to Glassboro State, AKA Rowan University, and then San Diego State University, I have to imagine your countless interactions with people, whether through studies or fellow students, professors and patients, and you eventually went from being a social worker to starting your own psychotherapy practice in Virginia, were similarly great source material for writing characters. From understanding everything about personalities and motivations to backstories, for instance. When I, got old enough to go to college, it never occurred to me that you could actually make a living as a writer. It seemed like something that was a hobby. So I went into social work instead. And it wasn't until um, I was 29, I guess, I was 30, that I um, started writing, actually writing down this story that I'd had in my mind for many, many years. As this story continued to bloom and evolve in your mind, there's eventually a moment of truth we'd love to hear about where you took the idea out of your head and began actually putting it down on paper in what would ultimately become your first published novel, Private Relations. Uh, it started out when I was a teenager um, living at the Jersey Shore, and I had a fantasy that my girlfriends and I would all live in a big house on the beach with Paul McCartney and Mick Jagger and James Brown. And so every night I would go to bed and I would feed this story. And then um, as I got older, I was still feeding it, but gradually the rock stars became real men and real fictional men. And my girlfriends and I became real fictional women so that 
by the time I was 30, I had this all worked out in my head, but I wasn't thinking this is a book. I was just thinking, this is how I get to sleep at night, is just making up this story. So one day I had a doctor's appointment, and he was very late, and I had a pad and a pen with me, and I just started writing down some of the scenes. And by the time he got there, which was about four hours later, um, I had a stack of scenes and I thought this was so much fun. I'm going to keep doing this. And so eventually it became that first book. And I think because I lived with it for so long and it was truly my baby and it was a learning process. It's not my best novel. Um, as a matter of fact, I tell most people not to read it, but it's those characters they traveled across the country with me. They, you know, I remember when I was finished and I sent it off to my editor and I walked in my office and I was like, they're gone. It was just the saddest feeling. So even all these years later, 30 years later, they're still in my heart. I did a 25 year anniversary edition of that book and I put an epilogue in it. So 25 years later, here's Here's what happened to these characters and the house that was so prominent in the story. Um, and that was, it was very satisfying to me. It was a little bit of closure so because it was just totally heart and soul in it. But when I look at that book now, um, you know, when I reissued it as its 25th anniversary and I had to look at it, <laughs> I can hear in the voice of the writing, I can hear Anne River Siddons and Alice Hoffman and the writers that I was reading at the time because I didn't have my own voice yet. Why do you think it is that readers need that closure so badly? Whether eventually in a series or at the end of a standalone novel, to have some idea of how things turned out for the characters they grew so attached to. If the author's done a good job and engaged the reader to the extent that the reader feels like they're they love these characters, then they want to know what happens. We look forward to airing Diane's episode in full in an upcoming season on a streaming network, but for now we're excited to talk with her about her latest releases. Big Lies in a Small Town was a masterclass in plotting, one Suspense Magazine spotlighted as exciting as a driver to this complex but thrilling story of two women in two different centuries, with only a mural as a link between them. Please talk about your method for crafting a dual timeline story like you did so effectively here. In outline form, I knew both stories, the um, past story in 1940 and the current day story. But when it comes to actually writing them, I do do one at a time. And the reason I do that is not to lose the thread of the story, but also not to lose the voice of the character. So, um, so I did all of Anna's, then I did all of Morgan's, and then I held my breath and alternated those chapters to see what would happen. It was a really wonderful surprise to me how well they fit together. I just had to tweak a few things. So, um, so I was amazed and pleased. You're famous among fans for adding epilogues to your books as a signature to your writing style. Why is that important book in and out? I often add an epilogue because I want to know too. Big lies in a small town. There is something that is left unsaid. And I'm still hearing from readers, you know, what happened when she went up to the door and knocked on the door. And um, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're not going to know. I actually did write it. And my editor said, this is not what the story is about. This is not the heart of the story. So I got rid of it. And I do believe she's right. But there's a lot of my readers who believe she's wrong. <laughs> they still want to know. The Dream Daughter, which Women's World praised as both rich and heartbreakingly written, features a lead protagonist in Caroline Sears dealing with a child with a heart defect, which is another long-term feature of your work. What do you still find intriguing about weaving these medical subplots into your character storylines? My previous career was as a hospital social worker. And specifically, I worked in adolescent medicine. And then before that, I worked in um, a maternity unit and neonatal unit. So that is uh, that always is still in the back of my mind and plays a part in a lot of my writing. 
And in that particular book, yes, I sought out some experts, um, a, a nurse that used to that I used to work with years ago in the in the maternity unit, um, and also just a whole lot of research uh, as far as at what point would this baby, what year would this baby be able to be cured in in a fetal surgery kind of setting. And the, the fun thing for me about that is my very first novel, which came out in 1989, was about a fetal surgeon. And so when I was writing this book, and it's a gazillion years later, I brought him in and he's the one who does the surgery. So it was really probably not fun for anybody except me, but just to like, oh, hi again, and you're, you look older and you are older and you're more experienced and you're still a nice guy. So it was just kind of fun for me to revisit an old character that way. Diving into one of your most recent hits with readers, the Austin Chronicle would hail it as an example. A white Chamberlain never disappoints with her well-crafted narratives. And this is one of her finest works, a swiftly paced story that's replete with intrigue, history and social justice. Please pull the curtain back if you would and give viewers a little bit of a look at what it's like working under deadline on a book like The Last House on the Street. Well, first it, it brought um, terror because I'm never, I, you know, I have a year contract to write a book and I'm just finishing up the book before it and going on tour for that. And, um, and I had no idea what I was going to write about. So there is that fear there. And then when I came up with the, the idea of the SCOPE program, which was a program that bought, brought um, Northern white students into the South to register black voters. When I came up with that idea, then I had to start building around it. Do I just want to tell that story? Do I want some present day story to go with it? Um, and who is this person and what's going to happen? So there's just so much to figure out and to get down on paper in an entertaining way and just do it all in a year. So probably um, there's a little excitement in the beginning, but there's also just stark terror. When do you start to feel the relief? My first drafts are super rough. Um, I don't ever edit, edit as I go because I change so much in the story that it's just a waste of time for me to edit until I'm completely done. So when I have that first really sloppy draft, then I'm happy. And then I have something to work with going forward. That's how I feel. Please tell readers and viewers about anything you've been working on they can look forward to engrossing themselves in next. It has no social import whatsoever, which is really, really different for me. Um, it does involve a plane crash. I could talk about that. And, yeah. and some deer. <laughs> but um, it's very unformed in my mind. So I'm not 100% sure where I'm going with it. So it's, it's too soon to talk. What is the balancing act between maintaining those traditional elements that keep fans happy while still adding that X factor that keeps it exciting for you book in and out? I think it comes down to my editor. And she is fabulous. And she is a great guide. And so if I had an idea that was really different, I would approach her with it. And she might say what she said when I approached her with um, the dream daughter idea, she said, wow, write it. So I think if I had an idea that was really different, you're giving me some ideas, really different. Um, you know, if she could see it, if she could see how it could work, I think she'd be supportive. What are the best and worst parts of being a best-selling author? I have to imagine interfacing with your fans around the world is an absolute blast, but maybe the travel will be a grind at times. I enjoy touring and it's been really kind of crummy because of um, COVID. COVID came about right as I was starting my tour for The Last House on the Street. So I never got to do as much as I wanted to do. There's nothing that I like more than um, standing in front of a room of excited readers. It's just a beautiful feeling. 
Um, so I do miss that. And I hope at some point that I can get back to doing that. Um, what I hate is that initial, I don't have any idea feeling. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, it's just, it's like this panicky feeling of, uh, I don't know what I want to spend a year writing about. And in the beginning, it just feels like, oh my God, I just, I don't know what's happening in this story. I don't know where it's going. Um, so that's really, that's the worst for me. 